I aspire to be a light to the world in the same way that this man is. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. It's been a dream of mine to start a book club and I hadn't really gotten around to it until now. Several episodes back, Brian Danielson was on the podcast, and he mentioned that he reads a book a week. Well, I kind of jokingly suggested starting a book club, and we ended up doing it. So what do you get when you combine a professional wrestler who loves to read and me who knows nothing about wrestling but also loves to read? You get the Why Not Now Read a Book Club. I love how books can build bridges. So you don't have to have read this first book that we're going to review today in order to get value from this conversation. We basically give you the cliff notes. The first book that we announced about a month ago is Factfulness by Hans Rosling. 10 Reasons Why We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. Bill Gates has actually highly endorsed this book, and he has said, quote, it's one of the most important books I've ever read, an indispensable guide to thinking clearly about the future. So not too shabby of an endorsement there. Also, what's super cool is that Bill Gates just announced he's picking up the tab for all U.S. graduates, college graduates, to download a copy of this book, Factfulness, that is so generous and so amazing given how powerful this book is. And as a reminder, to join the club, all you have to do is share your thoughts or photos of the book that we're reading on social media and include the hashtag why not now read a book also stick around to the end of this episode so you can weigh in on the next book that we read here's brian and i discussing the 10 reasons why we're wrong about the world and why things are better than we think We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery. Yep, the original before-you-go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you-know-what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit Poopery.com and Why Not Now listeners get 20% off with code Why Not Now. That's all one word. Also, you can now get Poopery at Target. So Brian, welcome back to the show. Here we are again. Yeah, I'm excited. Talking about books. Talking about books. We kind of joked about it, and you shared how much you love books and reading. And then look at what manifested. So we have our first book that we're reviewing today. And so we're going to dive into Factfulness by Hans Rosling. It is the 10 reasons why we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. So this book. So have you you done anything on, like, have you looked into how you actually pronounce his last name? Hans, uh, his last yeah. name? Uh, actually, good question. I thought I heard even Bill Gates say Roslyn, but am I saying that wrong? Yeah, well, so, I, so I've so i heard Roslyn, I've heard Roslyn, I've heard Ruslyn, because I say the same thing. I say Hans uh, Rosling, or sometimes I say Rosling, and I never know if I'm getting it right. <laughs> this is a great point. So I think I watched um, – 
Bill Gates, he did his review, of course, and then he, there was this kind of cool animated video. Did you happen to see that where he shows? Yeah, the, I did. Bill Gates does great stuff about books on his uh, Gates Notes website. So, I yeah. love it. And I yeah. think he said Rosling. But, okay, so we maybe we just pull the card of it could be pronounced differently in, in yes. Sweden. And I see the the R and the O. So if there was a, a vowel after the S, I think the O would be rose okay. because <laughs> there's not a vowel after the S. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's maybe somebody, soft. maybe somebody who's Swedish because <laughs> I had somebody on my Twitter say, uh, respond to respond to the thing. And they say, I can't believe, you know, who Hans Rosling is. We didn't, we, I thought he was just somebody who was famous in, in Sweden. Right. And I was like, I was like, no, of course, of course, I, I mean, but I, I didn't know who he was before before we read this book. So this is hilarious. So, uh, did you, I love this. Did, did you know anything about him? No, like I had never the, heard of him. Yeah, so I like one of the things. So I, I was just as I was reading the book, I was I just became more and more fascinated, and especially in the beginning, because in the there's the author's note, right? So here's it takes a while sometimes for a book to win me over. You know, um, this one did not take long, but one of the things that stopped me dead in my tracks is in the author's note. And he, and he talks about how this is his last battle, his last fight. This is the last Mm -hmm. chance he's, he's giving to this. And I was like, what is this guy? Some sort of quitter, right? Like I know that he had pancreatic cancer Mm -hmm. and I didn't know all this kind of stuff. Right. And so I was like, and so I was a little bit confused as I was reading it. I was like, oh, okay. Or maybe this is, he just thinks this is the best way to do it because you read about his TED Talks and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, but then I saw, then I started reading about how he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and that this is how he spent the last year of his life is working on this book. Like he thought this was one of the most important things in the world. This is going to be his contribution to humanity, right? And I I was just really won over by that. And I also was won over by, uh, (laughs) so the dedication, I think is the best dedication in the history of dedications. Do you remember what it was? Uh, I'm reading it now to the brave barefoot woman whose name I don't know, but whose rational arguments save me from, being sliced by a mob of angry men with machetes. <laughs> and <laughs> right. I remember that part. <laughs> yeah. He's like, so, factfulness saved my life. Her factfulness saved my life. <laughs> yeah. And so, and it's funny because he, he goes on to tell that story, but not till the very end of the book. Right. right? Yeah. And so like, uh, so I, so that's the first, this is how I consume books. Right. And especially like a hardcover book like this, I take the paper, thing that's around the book, I take it off because I travel with it and it's just becomes a nuisance. Right. And so like, especially so like he, he, he writes in there on the thing, this book is my last battle, my lifelong mission to fight devastating ignorance and like all that kind of stuff. And it talks about Hans Rosling was a medical doctor. So if I had realized that he had passed away, all that kind of stuff. But so I read this dedication and I'm thinking like most authors who write a book, their dedication is to their wife and to their kids and to this and to that or whatever, you know what I mean? But it's usually family or something like that. And here's this man and doing this dedication to this, the most bizarre heart, like endearing dedication to the brave barefoot woman whose name I don't know, but whose rational arguments saved me from being sliced by a mob of angry men with machetes. And I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> I like I like this guy. And if you go and you watch his TED Talks, it's really fascinating, you know, because he's like a he's such a dynamic speaker who speaks with such like intense energy, right? Oh, that like you get, you get sucked in to what he's talking about. And it's in the hands of somebody else, it would be so boring. Yep. It would be so boring. One of the things that I really liked about this book, so I read a similar book called Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. And uh, it is more, it is more, 
data and is more like maybe academic? more academic. Yes, more academic. That was a Bill uh, Gates one as well, right? Gates yeah, Gates yeah. recommended. I, so, so just so people know, I make it a point to read every ba- every book that Bill Gates suggests uh, because I don't know. That's just if he's. So why would you? Oh, yeah, when I when I when I started doing the thing about trying to read a book a week, it was because. Bill Gates reads a book a week, and if he has the time to read a book a week, and that's how he got to being Bill Gates, and I'm not talking about money-wise, I'm talking about intelligence-wise, and like the great things that the Gates Foundation does and all that kind of stuff. Like I aspire to be as useful to the world as Bill Gates is, right? That's my aspiration. And uh, and so like I want to – so if this is what he's doing, like I, I want to try to do the same thing. Right. And so, uh, so yeah, so, so enlightenment now was one of the, another book that he recommended and it was more academic and all that kind of stuff. And I think I like that kind of stuff, but I think it's less accessible to the public. This is this book. I felt like as, cause I would talk to my wife about these stories that he, that he has in there. I mean, there's a, there, I mean, there's just so many great stories, but one of the things that the, one of the ones that I loved was the fear instinct one where he, uh, he talks about the the plane crash and the guy crashing and then there's blood all over the place <laughs> and the guy's mumbling stuff and he thinks it's Russian so he thinks it's a Russian spy thing and like your worst fears come into your own mind but it just turns out that he he was speaking Swedish right mm-hmm. but he was just in his own head Hans had seen this other like he was thinking the the worst possible thing you know what i mean yeah and like, exactly and so uh but like he tells these amazing stories that get you sucked into the data that make the data that, that make the data more accessible that make his ideas more accessible and I, I thought that was really cool. Agreed, and it was the, the first thing I did is I went to go find him on Twitter, and I see that they say I think it says in his bio you know the late Hans Rosling or Rosling we're not sure about that. And I was just like, wait a minute, this book just came out. You know, this isn't even a year old. And um, immediately started kind of looking into it. And I thought, wow, bummer. And then at the end, he does talk about his journey of when he got the news of his yeah. diagnosis. And it became... Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. He canceled like 70, you know, speaking engagements or something like that just to focus on this to make sure he had the manuscript in the hospital and just amazing, amazing characters. So, and and we will get other authors on the podcast if we can. So note to book club members, we'll try and get them on with us. So let's just kind of start from the beginning. I mean, you turn the page from the dedication and all of a sudden you see this guy is a bit of a performer. He swallows swords, which is just such a juxtaposition because then you have his academic and data side. This guy is a uh, mastermind when it comes to numbers, but being able to articulate them in a way that are, that's interesting and that's understandable. And that was like, to your point, it's really captivating. The book starts with these 13 multiple choice questions, right? About the world and kind of the, the state of the union of all types of different huge areas uh, that we're concerned about with the world, whether it's financial stability to peace, um, poverty, you kind of name it. And how did you score with these 13 questions? So out of the 13 questions, I got seven correct, which I was mm-hmm. – so one of the things that he does is he talks about how like – so there's three – it's multiple choice questionnaire. So there's A, B, and C. And so he keeps he keeps talking about this throughout the book. And, and it's also very endearing as far as like – chimpanzees will get 33% right, right? <laughs> like that's like, – so just – and what that means is just like random guessing by whatever. You just hit a button or whatever. You, you're just – odds are you'll get 33% right if you don't know a single possible thing, right? So when he's – I was like, oh, I did substantially better than the chimpanzees. But I guess where I was really disappointed in my own scores was that I had already read Enlightenment Now, right? Oh. <laughs> so it's a – it's a very similar – it's a similar thing. So I had already read a lot of this data and still I – and, okay, 
one of the things, because I actually gave this questionnaire to some of my friends. And so like, so just so people listening can understand if you haven't read the book, these are some of the kind of the questions. Like question number five, there are 2 billion children in the world today, age zero to 15 year old, 15 years old. How many children will there be in 2100 according to the United Nations? A, 4 billion, B, 3 billion, or C, 2 billion. So this was one of the ones that I got wrong. (laughs) <laughs> and so like I had said, I had said, A, certainly, because I know that population is increasing. Certainly it's got to be 4 billion kids, right? And like, no, there's still going to be 2 billion kids according to the United Nations. You know what I mean? So like, so that sort of thing. But like, uh, I gave this questionnaire to uh, a couple of my buddies who, so when you're reading the book, you know that it's like 10 reasons why we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. So just with that title alone, you're going to go with more optimistic answers, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and so so I just gave it to people who had no idea like, "Hey guys, will you take this? I'm doing a book club deal and like uh just cuz I cuz I'm interested." The most anybody got right was 5, right? And most people only got like 3 right, which is like he said, less than the chimpanzees, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like, wow, like that's incredible. I will – how did you score? I got four right. Okay. So I'm I'm right there. It's basically – You're slightly under the chimpanzees. Yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean it's – what's crazy is that most of these answers, the right one wasn't even my – you know, if you break it down, you've got a 33% chance – Really, I wasn't even, in many cases, considering that last right answer. So I was, you know, toggling between the two, the two wrong ones. So of, of all of them, which one surprised you the most? Um, so I think, I think the population one is the one that surprised me the most. So the population one surprised me the most. I was actually very uh, disgruntled with one of the questions, to be fair. It's actually question number 11. And it said in 1996, tigers, giant pandas, and black rhinos were all listed as endangered. How many of these three species are more critically endangered today? A, two of them, B, one of them, or C, none of them. And I had guessed A, two of them are being more critically endangered, but the real answer is C, none of them. But the, and that, so, and this is, he talks about this in the book is you can you can t- you can get certain data points and use them to uh, to manipulate what people think, right? And I think this is a, this is one of the questions that it kind of does manipulate what you think. Oh, the uh, the extinction rate is is much lower than I had thought. I had read a book called The Sixth Extinction, right? And it's talking about uh, how we're in the sixth mass extinction in the history of, hu- of, of planet Earth, right? And it's caused by humans, and all these species are going extinct, and all this kind of stuff, and it's a huge, huge problem. And one of the things that I don't like about this specific question is that it's taken uh, three very charismatic large mammals that a lot of money has been put into to help save And so, like, they are no longer critically endangered, right? And so, but that's not, for example, like, the amphibians that are going extinct in uh, Central America, right? Like, it's not talking about that. These are are three very charismatic, large species that people are really working towards saving, Mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, all these other micro-species that people aren't as interested in saving. But on the flip side, and as he... So I was bitter about that one when I read it and I got it wrong and all this kind of stuff. I was a little bit bitter. But then he... One of the things that I really like about this book was that he, it goes on to say, like, why, why do we need to know these real facts? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he talks about is he talks about how... So it goes to show that when you take actions it improves things, mm-hmm. right? So like that, so I, here I go from being bitter about it to being like, okay, the reason why these, these large charismatic mammals have been saved is because we've directed a lot of energy towards saving them. And that means that if we direct 
more energy towards saving more species that we can do it we can be successful you know Mm -hmm. and i think that that's a very encouraging part of the book well it's interesting because when you started i I wasn't sure where you're going with that at first because i know how much of a uh environmental wildlife kind of activist you are and um and then I, I started to get what you're saying. I was like, oh, is that the negativity instinct? Yeah. <laughs> Which is one of the instincts. Which it, yeah. it, kind of, it kind of is, but it actually kind of isn't. Um, one of the things that he talks about is, and I'm trying to remember exactly how he phrases it, but I just love the, the combo and how they can coexist of that the world can be getting better while it's still bad or something yeah, yeah. like that. It can be bad and better. Bad and better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that is like, oh, yeah, it's back to these instincts. So he maps out, um, you know, these 10 different frameworks of why and how we've ended up thinking the way we do from the fear instinct to the straight line instinct and so on and so forth. And And what it did for me was it allowed me to obviously get it a little bit better from the answers of these questions, but also I've started finding myself applying this to my own life. <laughs> like with um, just everyday things, these instincts can be super helpful. A lot of times we think everything is so black and white and the, the gap instinct. Yeah. I caught myself yeah. doing that this morning with my husband earlier. I was talking about something <laughs> and I said, it's either this or it's that. Like the dog was uh-huh. up barking because either she was just had a lot of energy or there was something, there was animal outside because we live in the forest. And then I said, or maybe it was both, you know, because... Right. We, it's not black and white, but yeah, yeah. So was there one? Was there one specifically? So he goes through these ten reasons on why, because he's essentially what he's talking about is these dramatic instincts that humans have, and there's a reason why we have these. Like this is what we needed to survive, evolutionarily speaking. Like when he's talking, he explains like a lot of times why we have these things or why we think these things. Uh, some of them are evolutionary. Some of them are because. It's simple and our minds gravitate towards something that we can understand the easiest, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, was there one that you thought of that was like, okay, this one was the most helpful for me? Well, the one of the ones between the gap instinct and the binary. And I think oh. that's where, back to kind of my point of when he talks about the West and the rest, I was it was an eye-opener for me to realize that I guess one of the reasons why we're still believing some of this stuff is because it's still being taught. And the fact that there are still materials still being taught to young children to think and believe this way, that these facts are right, they're just outdated. And so that was just like, whoa, you know, we've, that's an issue, number one. Of course, that's going to be a problem because we're just spreading false information. But this sense of you're either rich or you're poor, the West or the rest, and, and the villain versus hero. So it's kind of a combo of binary and, uh, well, it's the gap instinct, I guess. But An interesting point on that. So, okay, so uh, for people who read the book, they'll know what we're talking about. But for, for people who, who, who don't, he and Bill Gates talked about this in um, his review of the book. He talked about how he needs to stop thinking of it in, the world in terms of the developed world mm-hmm. and the developing world as if there's two, there's only two types of worlds here, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's this one that's already developed as if we're at our final state of completion. Right. And then there's the one, the ones that are getting there. Hans breaks it down to four, four different groups mm-hmm. and he breaks them down into like, there's people. It, one of the things did you go to get the gap minder website, yeah, I did. It's amazing these illustrations and these visuals. Yeah, and so he he breaks he breaks life down the human like where people are. You know, there's seven billion people on the planet. He breaks down where people are economically speaking, right? So he has like level one, and these are the poorest of the poor. We're talking extreme poverty, uh, people who live on less than two dollars a day, and I think. One of the things that he does really well with this is he explains what that actually means. What does that look like? And so one of the cool things about the Gapminder thing and also about his TED Talks and all that kind of stuff is he gives these amazing illustrations where you can see, right, okay, like uh, people on level one who live on less than $2 a day, what, what does that look like? It means that they have to walk everywhere. That means that when they're getting drinking water, they have to walk 
to a place where there's water, fill up buckets, and then bring it back to, to wherever they live for their drinking water. You know what I mean? How do they cook? They cook using – like they build a fire and then they have to cook things, right? You know what I mean? They're, they're, sleeping, on, they're sleeping on the floor. They're not – for a while, I slept on a dojo floor, right? And you think like, oh, that's sleeping on the floor. No, what he's talking about is sleeping on, on the, the ground. Dirt. Like, sl- yes, mm-hmm. sleeping on the earth, right? So that's level one. Level two are people who make between two and eight dollars a day. And the difference is here is like, okay, these people have like bicycles, right? You know, like they they can cook with like a gas stove, or they may eat a little bit more complex things. They may have a bed, that sort of thing. And there's a huge difference between level one. And level two, and it's very hard for us because he goes on to so level three. Just so people have an understanding, is people who make from eight dollars a day to thirty-two dollars a day. Level four is anybody who makes above thirty-two dollars a day, right? I did the math on that, and I forget where I wrote it down, but that's like thirteen hundred dollars a year or, or thirteen thousand dollars a year to be on level four. And I think in the United States, that's considered considered poverty, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, but. The, you know, he's talking about like what a big difference this makes to be able to have a bicycle and then how, but still people on level two, if something bad happens to them financially, they can get back to level one, which is where they don't want to go. So it's like getting to level three, but, but explaining for those of us on level four, which is everyone in the United States, which is everyone in the United States, though, for those of us on level four, it's like, Levels one, two, and three kind of seem all the same, right? Because exactly. when, when he first started talking to me about this, he's like, like, I was actually demoralized that level four was $13,000 a year. And I was like, I mean, this all looks bad to me, right? And then he goes on to explain these different things and how what a difference it makes for them to have gas heat and all that kind of stuff. And you forget that like even – you know, and we had talked about this in the other in the other podcast because I did a uh, an American Revolutionary War deep dive books, right? <laughs> so I was like, man, these guys are walking twenty miles a day. A lot of them don't even have shoes, right? And it's freezing cold. It's like the the Northeast in the winter, and I go there, and I'm in my like I drop off my rental car and have to walk. Uh, three minutes from the rental car facility to the airport. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's cold. And I have a coat and warm shoes and all this different kinds of stuff. And these guys are walking barefoot, dying of hypothermia and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the difference. And he talks about in the, he talks about in the book how his grandmother, like when they first got their washing machine, she just sat and watched it the first cycle. She watched the whole thing, right? Because it's like, what a miracle. Do you know how much time I've spent hand washing clothes and warming up the water with a fire to hand wash clothes? And then he goes on to say, like, the, what does that mean as far as time? What do you do with that time? Well, because his mother didn't have to hand wash clothes, she was able to take him to the library like and education. read a book. Yeah. And, yet, and then so that time that is saved with these washing machines gets – pushed into like now you have this man who this charismatic educated man who's going all over the world spreading these ideas about how to help eradicate extreme poverty and all that kind of stuff that came from having a washing machine you Mm -hmm. know and so like uh yeah i so i was i like the different levels when you talk about binary thinking you know like stopping to think about it stopping thinking about it as far as like okay there's developed world and then there's developing world and there's really not much of a difference there's a huge difference between these levels you know for sure and if even if we take it a step down from the global umbrella and we look at just applying this logic to u.s politics there's you know there's such a tendency especially in i think the recent you know political cycle to say you're left or you're right and or you're this or you're that you're in this bubble or you're in that bubble. You're for so-and-so or against them. But actually, yeah. most people are somewhere in between in that spectrum. And it's almost like an easy out. It's kind of lazy to think, yes. oh, you're yeah. this or you're that. So I really like applying these principles to other things in life too. 
with you with these in- instincts did did any certain one resonate with you the uh, most? so i mean the, there were there were several um i tend to have be very strong on the negativity instinct. <laughs> <laughs> I picked that one up. <laughs> so when he talks about the negativity instinct, he, it's like this idea of, so you remember the past as being better than it actually was, but then you have this fear that things are getting worse, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think environmentally speaking, and, and that's where I, I actually think about it more than anything. Environmentally speaking, I think that that is absolutely the case. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. If you are digging this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment, and it means a ton to us. Also, after recording more than 100 episodes, I've created a bit of a cheat sheet on the top five things I've learned from renegades and how they get from idea to action, from dreaming to doing. I will email you the downloadable PDF when you subscribe to my newsletter. Just head to amyjoemartin.com and click on Connect With Me. One of the things that he talks about in here is that the reason why we need to have this fact-based thinking as far as the world goes is that so we know how to properly apply our resources and where to put things, right? As far as like climate change is like a huge is a huge thing. Like he talks about it's like, this is one of the things because he goes on and talks about in the book, like, Hey, these are some real problems that we need to address that we can't address if we focus on problems that aren't real. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, or, or problems that are, that are currently already being solved and are generally going to be solved with the, with the things that we have in place. But the, but the fear instinct of like, things are getting worse. Like that's like, I've, I've kind of, always had that a little bit as far as like, oh man, like, uh, you know, just with the extinction of species and then you get the climate change stuff and then you get the coral reef stuff. And then you're like, oh, what about the availability of clean drinking water? And I read this thing about, there was, I forget who it is. And it was like some Texas oil baron. And they said he bought up all this, uh, under like all this groundwater, like all the water reserves under like Oklahoma or something like that. And somebody asked him, uh, why did you do that? And he said, because we're running out of clean drinking water. And when we do, people are going to have to buy it from me. And like that, so that sort of reporting, because that like made a little mm-hmm. article or something like that. That's what he's talking about. It's like, we, gravi- we gravitate towards towards the worst things, right? And like, oh, oh no, we're running out of clean drinking water and all that kind of stuff. I, I think one of the, so that one was like a, a big one for me. Another one is the blame instinct, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To blame. So I, I grew up and, and I've always said this, I think I said this on the other podcast that we did. And I say, it, cause I say it all the time, even before I read this book, I said, I will say I grew up relatively poor. And because I always think of term in terms of, you know, we travel all over the world as WWE wrestlers, you know what I mean? And like, we see, we go to some places where the, the people are living in like these, level two and level three income groups. Right. And, uh, and so like, I've always said like relatively poor, at least for, for years, you know? And so I have this weird blame instinct is that I, for most of the world's pl- problems, I blame rich people. Right. Interesting. <laughs> so, How awesome is it that you're self-aware though of that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so like, and it's something that like, uh, my wife, when we first started dating, she really called me out on it. Like I, I automatically distrust people who have a lot of money. Like it's like, and I don't know, I don't know why this is right. You know, like when it, pretty much I, when it, where I grew up is a small town where everybody, not everybody, but there's not there's not many people who would you you would in the rest of the United States you would consider wealthy, right? And so like then you read all these things like I'm a, I'm a big Noam Chomsky fan and all this kind of stuff. So you read about corruption and then uh, like uh, Naomi Klein who wrote like the Shock Doctrine and all that kind of stuff, you know. And you talk about these big mega global corporations who are doing these horrible things. And it like, you know, he, he talks about it as he, he has a story in there. He's talking to some of his students and is saying like, uh, so, so what do you do if something, for example, if ExxonMobil is, 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 
is doing that. Like, I, whoever owns Exxon Mobil, I'm going to punch him in the face, right? <laughs> and it's like, like that example like, he gave. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm going. So okay, I'm actually meeting with uh, the the head of Exxon Mobil today. Uh, uh, but he's just doing it because he's got because he there's a whole council of people, you know, like the shareholders the, or something. Yeah, shareholders and all that kind of stuff. And then, so do you want me to go to the board? And into the board meeting, and punch everybody in the board, and and then okay, no, 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 it's not them. It's actually the shareholders because the board just does what the shareholders want, right? right and so, right. Uh, uh, but who are the shareholders? <laughs> well, for Exxon Mobil, and he's not, he doesn't use Exxon. It's Mobil. a pharmaceutical he, company. Yeah, or something he's like. a pharmaceutical company. But for Exxon Mobil, it's like okay, uh, it's probably like like for example, for me, somebody my age, it would be my parents. It's their retirement fund. And they want a stable income for their retirement funds. So ExxonMobil has to invest in a way that they are giving people reliable return on these stock options. But that's what my mom and my dad desired, right? That's what your grandparents desired. So really, who you should go and punch in the face is your grandma. <laughs> it's like... Right. It's All like, the way back around, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, uh, you know, and I thought, I thought that was a, a like... It's not entirely true, but like I have, I have that blame instinct, and he also talks about it the other way, as far as and I found this, um, I found this really good too. So, for example, I love Elon Musk, right, mm -hmm. from Tesla. You know, he's doing these incredible things, but the reality is, yes, he is doing some incredible things, but it's a whole group of people who are doing incredible things. One of the things that I absolutely, absolutely loved was in that uh, was in that author's note, and he talks about how this book, it's not just me. This isn't, let me see. What you are about to read was not invented according to the lone genius stereotype. It is instead the result of constant discussion, argument, and collaboration between three people with different talents, knowledge, and perspectives. This unconventional, often infuriating, but deeply productive way of working has led to a way of presenting the world and how to think about it that I could never have created on my own. And he goes on and he talks about the blame instinct as far as we also do it the other way that we you wouldn't think of as blame, but attributing things to people like Bill Gates or to, to attributing things to like Elon Musk or whatever. When the reality is, is that there's a whole, it's the, uh, I forget what term he uses, but it's like, it's the setup of how, of how something is structured. The systems that, and the, the yeah. Systems, yes. The systems that are in place that make it so productive and make it work. Right. Exactly. And like my, one of the things that he kind of talks about is, so I'm in a hotel room in Laredo, Texas right now. Is If I turn on the hot water and the hot water doesn't immediately go hot, oh, stupid, stupid hotel. Like, you know what? They're not stupid. Most people who do their jobs are good at their jobs. Most people who most people who live in this world and especially like here in the United States, if you've got a job or you've got a company, most of them are trying – they're trying to be as productive as possible. And they've also got intelligent people like who are doing productive things. Now, they may do things in a way that have unintended consequences or whatnot or things sometimes break and whatever it is. But the idea is not that, OK, this person is trying to ruin the world or this person is saving the world specifically on his own. It's like the systems that are, that are to cause for a lot of the bad things and a lot of the good things. And so that, that one really struck a chord with me. It's so easy to do too, just to, yeah. and it, and it's back to his, you know, way of setting the book up is that the ignorance is, that's a big sign. Like if you want to check yourself and kind of try and get over that blame instinct, what we can do is when we find ourselves doing that, asking ourselves, am I being ignorant? You know, yes. am I, it's pretty <laughs> quick. It's a pretty quick yeah. solution or answer. Yeah. Right? Dude, I like the way you phrase that because, uh, because like, if you say it in a way where it's like, okay, am I right about this? That's a little bit less harsh on yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> like if you say to yourself, am I being ignorant, right? <laughs> like nobody wants to be ignorant, right? <laughs> so right. Like, but I so, can't blame this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't bl if I blame this, I'm ignorant. And I, the last thing I want to do is be ignorant. That sounds horrible, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And to, to back to the negativity instinct real quick, because 
there was a moment when I was reading this book, and it's pretty early on in the book, where I, I was on a plane and I got to this section. And I'm going to read this part that I highlighted, and I was like, holy buckets. Everyone needs to read this book. And I was only 49 pages in, and that was this. Hans says, in order for this planet to have financial stability, peace, and protected natural resources, there's one thing we can't do without, and that's international collaboration based mm. on a shared and fact-based understanding of the world. The yeah. current lack of knowledge about the world is therefore the most concerning problem of all. And that combined with the fact that he also shared, you know, he's at Davos and talking to world leaders and they're scoring the same as the chimps, if not as good as the chimps on the test. Right, yeah, yeah. Is frightening. You know, it's like, wow, this is big stuff. And it doesn't have to be, it's not doomsday. It's just, we got to get this right. Right. It, and it, it's the people in powerful positions. Um, if they don't have a clear understanding of the world, how are they supposed to properly allocate their resources, right? Like exactly. uh, w one of the things that – so one of the things is how this book kind of changed my perception because he talks he, – one of the things that's really interesting about it is uh, he talks – so his, his basis, like his education is in statistics and in health, right? But he talks a lot about economics, and how economics affects world health and all that kind of stuff. Like, so one of the ways that this book has changed my perception is that he talks about, oh, one of the things he's talking about is if you are somebody who's investing money for yourself or for other people, like where, where yeah. should you invest it? Right. Because really there's all these people on levels, uh, income levels two and three who are going to start consuming more products. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. so like, okay, you can like, those are good place for investments and it helps. One of the other things that like when you're talking about allocations of resources. So my wife's, uh, my wife has a clothing company called birdie B, right. And they're a pay it forward brand. What they do is they give a certain percentage to charities, like for example, dress for success, which helps, uh, women in relative poverty help get like, dress them for job interviews and all that kind of stuff so that they can be so they to help them get jobs right which is great but one of the things that like i had talked to my wife about is the thing that he's talking about with tampons that we just don't even like one as a man i don't think about it anyways <laughs> but it's just like but he talks about uh in level four countries they're working on tampons for every different situation. There's a yoga <laughs> tampon. There's a tampon for this. And the, and the idea is that, oh, the, a slimmer, trimmer, whatever, a tampon that you don't even feel, this or that or whatever it is. And the reality is, okay, do, do we need that on level four? But where you could really either make money or help, really help people, is those women getting to level two now where they just, if they have a a good tampon that will last them all day because they don't have time to like, okay, they're not going to do yoga. They're not going to do these things. They need something that they can use and will last them all day, right? And they won't have to worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. So very basic, a very basic tampon. And so like for my wife's company, so one of the things that we had just talked about is like, oh, what would it look like if you're a pay it forward company and you want to make the best possible investment, right? As far as like what is going to help the most on this planet? Like if we're interested in women's health and women's education and all that kind of stuff, would it be better to do this with our resources or would it be better to provide – very basic all day tampons for people at level two, which you would, one of the things, uh, so I had read a, or I'd seen an interview with Bill Gates. I keep bringing up Bill Gates. I wanted him to run for president, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just, you know, it, uh, I, we can talk about that some other time, but it you was, uh, know. Maybe, but, maybe next time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but one of the things that somebody asked him is like, you're investing all this money into, into what they said, third world countries. And, he said, and like, why aren't you investing that? We have plenty of problems here in the United States, and why don't you invest them here? And he essentially said, well, because even though – he didn't say even though I'm the richest man in the world. <laughs> but he said even though we have a lot of money 
here in the United States, all this money only goes so far. For me to do the most amount of good for this planet, if you see us all as one, right? If you see everybody in the world as one, like we are not, we are not separate, we are not that much different. The best thing that I can do for the world is get these people out of extreme poverty. Like my money will do the most good helping these pe- helping these children get vaccinations and helping them do that and that sort of thing. But like when he's talking about like how we use resources and all that kind of stuff, I was like, man, how am I using my own resources as far as like what what am I giving to? How can I best use these resources? I I, I found that to be very powerful. Oh, it's such a good point. It's it's critical and also it reminds me of um it's it's like looking at the systemic cause of something like there's a story in the book where hans talks about because he's a medical doctor too and practiced more medicine it sounds like earlier in his career and he was at the in this maybe level two level three country probably level two and he was providing medical care at a hospital and there there was an influx or something or actually, I don't even remember the exact scenario, but the, the point was everybody wanted to increase resources for the hospital so they'd have more physicians. And what they really needed to do was find better transportation to the hospital because a lot of people couldn't even get there first. So it was like just kind of going back to like the true systemic cause for something. And I think that's why he was asked to speak to so many investment banking companies and huge financial institutions because they're wanting a better grasp of what's going on with the world yeah. and whether or not they apply his, his logic and solutions is another story. But it's so much, like to your point, is around resources. And no, we need more money to actually get ambulances because nobody can get to the hospital. It just really makes you stop and, and think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting too, because he did, he was so powerful as a speaker, right? One of the things that I loved about the book is his, just his dedication to truth, right? His dedication to facts. And like, he tells the story about Al Gore, Mm, Al Gore wanting him to make, uh, uh, a bubble graph or a gap minder thing for climate change, but make it, give the worst possible scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm somebody who was, so Al Gore, obviously the first, uh, what what was the first um, documentary? Truth. um, Uh, Inconvenient Truth. Inconvenient Truth. And I watched that and I go, man, Al Gore, he's my guy, right? And then I'm like, wait a second, this guy has like a huge house and flies in private jets and all that kind of stuff. And then as somebody who is a... Blaming the rich. An an, an an environmentalist. And then again, the blame thing of like, (laughs) okay, like, oh, this guy's rich and he just wants, uh, he's going to make money on this carbon tax trade or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I have those, those things going on in my mind anyways. And then he talks about how Al Gore wants him to to make things seem worse than they already are because fear inspires people to make sudden change. So that's the one where he's, uh, I forget which instinct, it's one of the last ones, but it's like the one where you have to do things fast. Urgency, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, uh, like this is an emergency, we need to do this. And he refused to do it uh, because he is dedicated to the truth and you don't want to make decisions based on irrational ideas, like on like uh, an, an irrational thing just because you think you need to hurry to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And like that really that really won me over as far as like, like hey, because he's a big, if you listen to his TED Talks, and it doesn't come across so much in the book, but he's very concerned about climate change, right? Mm-hmm. When you listen to his TED Talks, he's like, that's one of the big things that we have to tackle. That's one of the things that the facts – are the the facts that we're talking about. This is something that humanity needs to tackle, right? Uh, But even for that, he's not willing to dramatize it. He's not willing to make it seem worse. He thinks that the best way that we can allocate our resources towards this is by providing a very truthful, fact-based idea on what's actually going on. I I mean, like that – that that I mean I, I had already been won over at that point, but I was just you know I was I was really really impressed by that. Yeah, <laughs> I, to stand I up was, to Al Gore and say yeah. no, I'm not drawing your bubble and 
Yeah. Can't motivate by fear. And sorry, buddy. I'm not, I'm not drawing you a bubble. I'm not giving you a bubble. You don't get your own bubble, right? Like, yeah. Like, oh, he's my guy. His whole career, right? It, it really it, it depended on that. You know, it seems like that's why he was able to write this book. And who else really would be able to? There are probably very few people. And yeah. one of the things he said, and just to kind of kind of sum him up, I thought this was so powerful. He said, I'm a very serious possibilist. That's something I made up. It means yeah. someone who neither hopes without reason nor fears without reason. Someone who consistently resists the overdramatic worldview. And yeah. I thought that was a really good line to kind of sum up his character. Uh, absolutely. Like, and, you know, um, we were talking before this and, and you were talking about how you had spoken to the editor uh, or one of the, one of the people who run Flatiron Books who published, who published Factfulness and who said that like he would have loved to have been on this podcast. And I, so I watched these Ted talks and I like, and you like the bill, I posted a, a thing about that Bill Gates wrote about the book on my Twitter. Uh, but you can also just go to Gates about it but he talks about because bill gates knew him and went to him for information right and uh that just speaks to how valued he was in this world by high level people right uh but uh, like he spoke with such energy there's even on gapminder.org their website they have uh, a video that they did and this is like while he was sick and you can see he just speaks with so much energy. But like uh, they, they said like he would have loved to have been on this podcast talking about it. And you can just see like with his energy and zeal how much fun that would be. Right? Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Like, what a wild character just swallowing swords and like all this kind of stuff. Like, oh, my gosh. What a blast that man would have been. Actually, it, I don't know how you felt about it, but it retroactively – and this was I, – I didn't start reading the book until well after a year after he had passed. But it retroactively made me sad about his death, right? Like, mm -hmm. like oh, man. Like that – that's really – because it – like what a light. What a light in the world. But I think one of the things that do – I think people like that are an inspiration in the sense of like I aspire to be a light to the world in the same way that this man is, right? The way that – his energy, the way he talks to people, the way he, the way he speaks, and even mostly an entertainer. That's what I do. I wrestle, right? I wrestle. Mm -hmm. I, I go out there in my spandex battle jammies and I just do my thing, right? <laughs> and uh, and but he goes out there and entertains and educates with such zeal that like it just you can't help but feel it when you watch it. So I I, I loved that. That's such a great point and. I really appreciate that about you too, Brian, because if you think about it, Hans wasn't just a, a, you know, a PhD data scientist. He was a communicator. He was a performer and he had all these things about him with you. Obviously you're a performer and an athlete, but even through things like your, the reality TV show, you're able to surface conversations and topics that, uh, that you feel is important. You're able, like, you didn't have to come on this podcast. You didn't have to start this book club. And, and so it just shows that we're not all just one thing. There's so many facets and ways we can make a difference within our swim lane, per se. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, With, within our own individual spheres. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, okay, should we talk about the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, you and I had talked about it just briefly before this. So how we're going to decide the next one is that you are going to put up, nominate a book. I will nominate a book and then we'll do some sort of poll on social media. And I, I'm letting, I'm letting, I'm letting other people besides me figure out how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I will not so bad with social with media. <laughs> but yeah, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'll let you explain it kind of afterwards. But what what is the book that you were nominated? Oh gosh. I've as I was reading this one, I've been thinking, okay, what's the next? What's the next? And um, just out of we'll call it serendipity, I received an advanced copy of this book that just came out Monday. I read it last week, but it's now out. It's called The Third Door. Okay. And this gentleman, Alex Benayan, started at age 
19, 18, 19, on a quest. And he wanted to go talk to people like Bill Gates, Lady Gaga. The list goes on and on and on uh, of, of people that are the best of the best of what they do and learn how they got started. And so mm-hmm. the third door is all about how none of them took the normal you know, front door. You get in line and you wait and you go through the traditional route in. And none of these people also had access to the VIP door when they were getting started. So they found another way. And, uh, and it's really good. And his quest is what's even more amazing. But we're talking about you know, people from every vertical that are at the top of the top. So um, he has found a way to get to Warren Buffett. He's found a way to get to them and ask his questions. So it's pretty mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, that's a, that sounds fascinating. So my nomination is a book called Creative Quest by Questlove. Ooh, I love <laughs> which it. Is like, uh, yeah, which is like not something that I think people would expect me to read, but it's a book on, on creativity. And this is a guy who's like, Super creative. Oh, so I like yeah. all different type. I like all different types of music, right? And so one of the things I love to do is every month, like the you know, there's these lists of like, okay, the best albums that came out in May of 2018, right? And I will just listen to as many of them as I can. I spend a lot of time on the road, so it's like I had a six hour or I had a six and a half hour drive from Arlington, Texas to Laredo, right? So what are you going to do in a car for six and a half hours? You're going to listen to some music at some point, you know what I mean? So, uh, so uh, you know, I, I I'm just like impressed by by his creativity and all that kind of stuff. But it's like the idea is what like what is creativity? Like, how can you make creativity work for you? What does it even mean to be creative? Well, like, what what is what does all of that mean? And like, I'm always fascinated by uh, by creative aspects for people. So I, I, you know, I read so much, um, but I have never once read a Stephen King novel. Ooh. But <laughs> but I read Stephen King's book on writing. Oh, I was just going to ask if that's the one. That's the only one I've read too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How funny. So I, read his, I read his book on writing because I was uh, just fascinated uh-huh. by like, okay, how does Stephen King write? Right. You know, like there's people like John Irving who, uh, meticulously plot out every plot point so that things make sense and that sort of thing. But then Stephen King is more as more like he starts with a story and lets the story take its take itself away right like yeah. go, like go on its own like the characters develop themselves like that sort of thing and i so i've just always been fascinated by creativity and how different people's creativity works and how i can apply like different aspects of people's ideas on creativity to my own life so that's that's why i thought that's why I thought uh, that one would be a, a good choice for me so we'll we'll put it up on some sort of social media poll and let let the listeners and people who are interested decide on, on what, we, what we cover next. Sounds good. Sounds fair. I'm excited either way. I don't think we can go wrong. And thank you for joining me. So we'll uh, have uh, a fun reading. And I had a quick question. So do you, how do you remember? Because you read so fast and you read like a book a week. So do you wait until right before we review it to read it? or No, no, no. I, I read fact. So I read Factfulness in three days um, at the <laughs> beginning of, so we went to Europe, uh, in like at the beginning of May and I read it in three days and then I, uh, reread it a week later after I finished another book, just so I would be up on the points. And then actually on my drive from Arlington to, uh, Laredo, I was listening to the audio book. So I didn't get through the entire audio book, but it was just a good refresher course. And I take notes and I like, like I had talked to you before, one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated, one of the things that books has done, for, books have done for my life is I am not a naturally social person. Uh, like I'm not just interested in like, oh, and talking about what's your favorite TV show, right? Like, what do you watch? Oh, I watch this. I mean, that when people start talking about television or they start talking about celebrities or gossip or whatever it is, I start tuning out. But if you talk about ideas, like all of a sudden my heart, my heart springs up, right? Like this ideas are what fascinate me. And then so by reading these books, like, 
I could talk about ideas with people. So one of the things that I loved about this book and one of the things that I, uh, that I thought was, was really great was the questionnaire because the questionnaire, like you can read this book. And you don't have to hand people out questionnaires like I did. But uh, for me, it's a uniting thing, right? Like people that I'm working with, we're on a European tour. We're stuck together for 18 days, right? <laughs> like yeah. what are we going to talk about? Like these people who uh, were just brought together by work, but we have a lot of just time on buses and time in planes and that sort of thing. It's like talking about these ideas and like, okay, what do we know? What do we not know? Like what do you think about this? Even if they haven't read the book. It's like bringing up these ideas or calling somebody out on like, hey, that's the blame instinct. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You explain it to them and they're like, I don't think that's real. And then I learn a lot by trying to explain things that other people haven't read. And so like that, I don't know. It's just also mentally stimulating. But that's one of the reasons that I've that I've been able to stay so in touch with this specific book is because this was a, a ver very much a book that you could talk to other people about and keep the ideas fresh in your head because you have to explain a lot and defend a lot and all that kind of stuff. So I, yeah, so that's how I did it. Well, that's inspiring. I have to say I didn't actually go through the book three times, just <laughs> once, <laughs> but I will, uh, I'll make sure that, uh, the next one we will be ready we will definitely be ready and yeah. we'll see you next time yep absolutely so in order to vote on the next book that we read follow along on twitter brian's handle is at wwe daniel brian and that's d-a-n-i-e-l-b-r-y-a-n on twitter i am at amy joe martin and we'll do a poll on Twitter soon after this episode is released with the book nominations so you can vote for the one that you want to read. And as a reminder, to join the club, all you have to do is use the hashtag on social media, hashtag why not now read a book, share your thoughts and share your photos. Happy reading. <laughs>